Good evening, depending on wherever you are. Good day to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Shivani Khare, your host for the day. I take great pleasure in inviting all of you to the Global Emerging Tech Summit 2021, organized by University of Emerging Technologies, co-sponsored by the Emerging Tech Foundation, Computer Society of India, Global Engineering Dean's Council, and International Federation of Engineering Education Societies. University of Emerging Technologies is about E5, evangelize, educate, empower, enlighten, and engage about emerging technologies. This conference is about bringing emerging tech closer to the next generation of professionals and making effective use of virtual education. We are delivering a series of six lectures ranging across various topics in emerging tech over three weekends, that is six days, Saturday and Sunday in six sessions. Every session is opened by a keynote speaker who is an eminent personality from either tech or education, followed by the lecture of the day. The attendees are encouraged to send in their questions during the lecture. It can be via chat, tweet, email, and then we'll have a separate Q&A session soon after the completion of the lecture. After that, Mr. Prasad Mabudiri, CEO of University of Emerging Technologies, will deliver his closing remarks and also answer some of your questions. Now I take pleasure in introducing a keynote speaker for the day, Mr. Venkatesh Parasram. He is the Vice President of Computer Society of India. Mr. Parasuram is a postgraduate in management and a serial entrepreneur. He carries 25 years of work experience in a wide range of domains. Currently, he is dedicating his time and energy to the Computer Society of India for empowering the student and teaching community with his collective learning skills and upgrading the knowledge to meet the industry expectations. He is also supporting various organizations in the product and process development as a technical advisor. Please welcome a keynote speaker for the day, Mr. Venkatesh Parsaram. So please. Yeah, thank you, Shivani. Uh, that was short and brief and uh, really good. Namaste to all and welcome to all the participants and the members and the board of governors, board members, honorable guests from the Education Council, CSI members, IFES, GDC, the supporting partners of this Global Emerging Tech Summit 2021. I'm happy to be the part in experiencing this summit in virtual mode. And would like to mention that this pandemic time has taught us to tweak ourselves in evolving into differential method of learning. Taking it positively, I mentioned this is a boom. Now is the time when there is no border or boundaries for learning and gaining knowledge with the emergence of virtual learning mode. And even better, when they are certified by the professional bodies like CSI, IFES, GDC, and UET, which helps in your career growth. And all this without travel, stay, and from your comfort of your home. Let's embrace this method of learning as sky is the limit, and there is abundant certified knowledge available for you from the lectures during the summit. On behalf of Computer Society of India, I'm happy to have CSI partner with University of Emerging Technology, supported by the Emerging Technology Foundation USA, towards bringing the change through this tech summit. At UET, you have the opportunity to hear from the academicians and industry experts from different countries, bringing their experience and knowledge for the benefit of the student fraternity under one platform with various emerging technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity, cloud services, mobile computing, and to name a few top, 
And most importantly, you would go through the role-based experience learning. For the benefit of an understanding of the C uh, about the CSI to all the participants who are from different countries, Computer Society of India was formed in 1965 and is a premier professional body with many members from the India's famous IT industry leaders, brilliant scientists, academicians, and educational institutions. The CSI has been instrumental in guiding the Indian IT industry down the right path since its formative days. Now, the need of the hour for today is acquiring knowledge from any source what you get towards the job ready skills. And at UET, you can see this transformation. I believe in that. Uh, all participants from, for the summit would be hearing from the eminent experts in, this, in their respective domains. From the series of lectures, starting today for the next three weekends. And more on AI and ML, uh, the eminent speaker, Bill Voris, would be giving that. And I have gone through that challenges in cybersecurity from Shah Zanani and web service cloud from James D'Souza, mobile app development from Ravi Satar and digital transformation from Sesha Kishore and no coding application development from Bharat Kumar. These, these are the uh, power pack lectures which you will be uh, hearing over the three weekends. The details are already shared with all and uh, I would uh, only suggest uh, please make the best use of it. And let's emerge into the future with the practical differential and role-based learning during this pandemic time and also future. All said, with this, I'm happy to announce the Global Emerging Tech Summit 2021 Open. Welcome all, have a power pack session. Namaste. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful speech. Now I take the pleasure in introducing our speaker for the day, Mr. William Boris. Mr. Boris is the president and chief data scientist at Data Magnum. Data Magnum is a data science consulting organization. He is, a, he is currently a contributing editor at datasciencecentral.com, which is the leading online community and content website for data science. He has also been the editorial director for many years. In that role, he has authored over 300 articles and white papers, which have been read more than 2.5 million times. Additionally, Mr. Warris is an executive board member for the University of Emerging Technologies. Mr. Warris is going to speak today on the tools and applications in machine learning and artificial intelligence. What makes Mr. Warris' background particularly suited to this topic is, he opened his first data science consultancy in 2001. For the last 20 years, since the earliest days of the field, he has lived and helped develop these tools and applications through its period of most dramatic innovation, and now its current period of intense adoption. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. William Morris. So please. Shivani, thanks very much for uh, that nice introduction. Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen, and uh, thanks everyone for having me today. Let me get this technical detail out of the way. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, for a profession that's concerned with accuracy, as data science is, we're really very, very bad at establishing clear definitions. And, and the poster child for this confusion is the phrase artificial intelligence. So here's an in-joke we tell each other. You know, when, when we're talking to a customer, it's artificial intelligence. But when we're talking to a VC, it's machine learning. And when we're talking to another data scientist, it's statistics. So this language is uh, very confusing to a lot of folks. And the popular press has frankly hijacked the term artificial intelligence to apply to everything we do in data science, which isn't correct. And it really gets in the way of understanding what we do and how we do it. So today, you know, with every com company you can think of rushing headlong into its digital journey, there are just not enough people who really understand uh, what the tools of data science can do, and particularly what they can't do. So whether or not you're going to pursue a career in data science uh, or just going into a role in business or government or education, you need to understand this field from a data scientist perspective 
So you'll be better able to lead smart conversations about the data science projects you're gonna encounter. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, four broad areas. Uh, we're gonna try and clear up this perception that everything is artificial intelligence and split out from a data scientist point of view, you know, what is machine learning and what does a data scientist think is artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about the tools we need uh, to, to use with an emphasis on the most modern stuff, uh, deep learning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you learn it and how you practice machine learning and AI. And for just a brief second, we'll talk about where we think this is all headed here. So, so here's the secret. Uh, this field has, has <laughs> I was gonna say it's changed name. That's not actually correct. The press has changed the name of our field a bunch of times over the last 20 years. And if you go back to the 1990s, you'll see it referred to as data mining or predictive modeling or uh, uh, machine learning or deep learning. You know, the fact of the matter is the best phrase that most accurately describes what we do in data science today is machine learning and artificial intelligence. So here's the, uh, here's the real secret. 95% of what we do uh, is to train models. That is, uh, we are building models that, that learn by example to predict either a future behavior or a future value. So a future behavior, uh, almost all of that is consumer propensity. You know, why they come, why they stay, why they go, uh, what will they buy next? Uh, or predicting a future value like the, uh, the price of Amazon stock next Monday or the spot price of oil or, or how many widgets I'll sell or how much that customer will be worth over his lifetime. Uh, or, you know, now that we have image and text, uh, is that a, a Ford or a Chevy? Uh, that image is a Ford or a Chevy or, is, or does that uh, text from the customer say that he wants a red dress or a blue one? So to train by example means we start with data uh, associated with a known outcome. That is, uh, for example, customers who bought in the past and we know a lot about them. Uh, we train the model. Uh, we can use uh, both data that we have and data that we can add from external sources. And then finally, uh, we apply that model to, to data that we've never seen before, potential new customers to predict who is most likely to, uh, to perform according to what we've trained. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart and I'm showing you this uh, not to make you read all of these names of the techniques that we use, uh, but rather so that you'll understand when you hear the phrase decision tree or random forest or logistic regression or neural net or Bayesian analysis, you'll recognize these as part of the data science toolbox and all of them are machine learning. So if you become a data scientist, you'll learn most of these in some detail. Uh, but if you're a business leader and you just want to recognize or recommend data science solutions, you need to know that they're part of our toolbox. Here's one of the most powerful concepts uh, that we'll be talking about today, because you know what? Everything we do in data science answers only five questions. And here they are. And if you remember these, uh, you'll always know whether or not uh, a potential business problem is suitable for data. So the first one, is it A or B? So this is classification. Uh, and some examples might be, uh, will this machine fail in the next 72 hours? Yes or no? Uh, which brings in more customers, a $5 coupon or a 25% discount? Uh, or if a, a customer calls into your customer service rep, uh, should I try to cross sell X or Y? So in uh, question two, is this weird? This is uh, very much the, the era, of the uh, domain of anomaly detection, which is largely used in uh, all the financial services to detect, for example, fraudulent transactions, uh, but also in uh, the management of your uh, network security to identify uh, bad actors that are trying to break into your system. And it's very much like classification, a special set of uh, classification tools uh, to determine. 
Number three is uh, not sure how many. This is regression. That is, uh, what will the temperature be next Tuesday, or what will my fourth quarter sales be? The number four uh, is one that not many people think of, and that, that is, how is it disorganized? And by that, this, we mean the data, because there are a lot of ways to tease out the structure of data. Uh, so one approach that you'll hear about is clustering, which separates data into natural clumps, which makes it easier to uh, interpret and to analyze, very important. And then finally, uh, what should I do next? And this is strictly the, uh, the realm of um, reinforcement or, or mathematical optimization calculations. Uh, it's a good fit for automated systems that have to make a lot of small system, uh, small decisions without human guidance. Uh, it's, for example, if I'm a self-driving car, uh, should I, uh, and I see a, a yellow light, should I brake or should I accelerate? Uh, for a robot vacuum, should I keep vacuuming or should I go back to my station? Uh, or frankly, for human beings, uh, if my inventory level falls to X, uh, should I reorder? So a lot of people think that uh, data science is all about the algorithms and they always wanna talk about the uh, algorithms. Uh, but to understand how data science has emerged uh, and broken into such a powerful tool, you need just a little history. So data science was alive and well in the 90s and the aughts, uh, most of it in direct marketing at uh, banks, insurance companies, and large directors. Uh, but prior to 2000, we had pretty much all the tools we have today, but we were held back by two factors. Uh, first, as you might imagine, was simply the uh, raw compute power. Uh, but the second problem that we had before 2007 was even more important. And that is that we could only hold data in relational databases, meaning that uh, it was uh, held in, in very small fields, mostly numericals with a few text fields. Um, and as, as you undoubtedly know, uh, relational databases are uh, uh, slow, to, uh, slow to change. Uh, they're tough to data, get data into and out of. Uh, if you have a, a new data source uh, in relational database, you have to uh, fully map its presence in your database before you can get to use it. And sometimes that takes weeks or months. But what happened in 2007 is we had the arrival of big data. Now, by the way, big data is another naming fiasco uh, that we need to take the responsibility for because it's not about just big. It's not about just volume. Uh, more importantly, uh, it's about variety, uh, which in our language means image, video, audio, text, uh, unstructured or semi-structured data that previously did not fit in a relational database. And then finally, velocity, that is data in motion, it's streaming data from sensors uh, that are the, uh, the data sources for our, our, our Internet of Things applications or real time streams of financial data like stock prices. So our, our big data database uh, known as NoSQL, which simply meant at the time that you couldn't use SQL as a query language on it, was a, a new family of databases without the rigidity of relational databases. The first one, of course, you probably have heard of is Hadoop. Of course, these days, uh, what you'll see is that Relational databases and NoSQL databases have uh, come back together and been put together in, in families of databases that you can, in fact, uh, use uh, SQL on. But the most important thing here is uh, actually not that uh, Hadoop and, and NoSQL could store unstructured data, uh, but that in point of fact, uh, it was a method for making multiple, multiple computers work as though they were one. This is where we got the ability to do massive parallel processing, which almost immediately uh, rapidly accelerated our compute and became the, uh, the core of uh, cloud compute for data science today. So here's a little bit about how this emerged. Uh, you know, on the, uh, on the bottom axis, we're gonna talk about whether or not the insights that a particular technique gives you are specific, that is uh, 
percentage wise uh, accurate or whether or not they're simply directional. And on the vertical axis, we'll talk about the different types of data that emerged and how they have uh, facilitated the various things that have evolved in data science. So starting immediately, uh, we got uh, data lakes, which was our ability now, instead of having relational database, if we had a bunch of data that we wanted to take a look at, we could dump it into a Hadoop database, a NoSQL database, and uh, play with it, which became very powerful and the, the first step in putting some uh, unstructured data uh, back into our predictive modeling. Then uh, recommenders also based on semi-structured data. Uh, we got these uh, systems that could analyze huge volumes of web logs and do it essentially in real time so that we could, we could recommend to our customers what they should buy, what they should watch or read, uh, who we should date. This also meant uh, that we were able to down start natural language processing, which in the beginning uh, was for the most part, just big bag of words analysis uh, that was mostly used in sentiment analysis. Uh, that was, uh, was that caller to the call center satisfied? Uh, did you think the product was too expensive? Was it the wrong color? Uh, was the food good? Was the service lousy? You could, you could get generally directional information out of bag of words. But today, uh, obviously natural language processing is much more sophisticated uh, and it allows us to interact with Alexa and Siri um, and even to have the uh, more important platforms that you know of as intelligent automation or robotic process automation, which is often where companies these days start on their digital journey. Now, uh, we haven't talked about uh, data in motion, uh, but the Internet of Things is based entirely on streaming data, uh, which uh, can be part of uh, and frequently is input to very specific predictive modeling uh, and is part of edge computing. And then finally, we have uh, our new non-traditional techniques in machine learning. And this is where we get the new artificial intelligence techniques, deep learning, a convolutional neural nets, second generation neural nets that underlie the advancements in speech, text, and image processing, and reinforcement learning, which are the techniques that enable self-driving cars uh, and let computers win at chess. Now here's how the popular definition of uh, artificial intelligence and data science come together. Because many people think that we've only just suddenly arrived at artificial intelligence and that's simply not correct. And in point of fact, this has been an altogether evolutionary process as almost all science is. So uh, we built on handcrafted expert systems. We added machine learning. We added uh, our ability to do big data. And now we've talked, we're adding deep learning, which are the second generation neural nets like convolutional neural nets and recurrent neural, neural nets. So um, let's come back to artificial intelligence for a minute. So there have been a lot of efforts uh, to define what AI really means, uh, but most of them are contradictory and they just end up missing the distinction between the popular definition and what we data scientists think of as uh, actual artificial intelligence. And our founders of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning have thought about this for a long time. Uh, a lot of you know about that. that's like 71 years old now. And that is, can a computer convince a human that they're communicating with another human? Another test that was uh, proposed was by uh, Steve Wozniak, who you may recognize as a co-founder of Apple. And he proposed that we'd have artificial intelligence when a a robot could walk into a strange house uh, and find all the ingredients and the tools necessary and, and successfully make a cup of coffee. And then uh, later on, uh, Robert Getzel uh, proposed that we would have artificial intelligence when a robot could enroll in a human university 
and take classes in the same way as humans and get its degree. Well, actually, this is getting pretty close. Uh, the Chinese back in 2017 had a robot uh, that competed with grade 12 students during their country's national college entrance exam. And it got 105 out of 150 points. It was below average. But on the other hand, it finished in 22 minutes where most students took two hours. So not, real, uh, not a real win. Uh, but later in that year, also in China, uh, a different robot passed a written test of China's National Medical Licensing Exam, and the robot scored 456 points, which was 96 points higher than the required mark. Uh, no word about whether or not that robot was put into private practice. And then uh, finally, we've got folks like Nils Nielsen, who's one of the uh, real founders of artificial intelligence research. And he proposes that we'll, we'll know we have artificial intelligence when in fact uh, our AI can uh, take over the job of actual human beings uh, and before them uh, can either fully partially replace them. And of course with, uh, for example, intelligent automation today and uh, chatbots, you'll see that a lot of, for example, uh, customer service representatives have in fact been replaced by our AI. So the way I like to think about it is actually to be a little broader than these examples. Um, and the reason I like to spend a little time on this is that AI is supposed to demonstrate human-like capabilities and to be able to replace uh, humans in that activity. And because it informs what we expect our AI to be able to do, uh, what human-like capabilities it will need to have, I like to start with this kind of anthropomorphic model and on the left, you see, it'll need to see, which are still of video images. It needs to be able to hear, that is receive input via text or spoken language. It'll need to speak, that'll be able to respond meaningfully uh, to uh, input, same language or frankly, any language. It'll need to make human-like decisions, uh, be able to offer advice or new knowledge. It'll have to learn, it'll have to change its behavior based on changes in its environment. And, and ultimately, uh, it'll have to maneuver, move or manipulate physical objects. So here's how this actually lines up with our new technologies. So I, bit, I realize this is a bit of an eye chart uh, and I'll, I'll let you follow along the red lines for yourself, but I will just talk about these six new modern tools that data scientists think of as artificial intelligence in our field. So image processing is largely handled by convolutional neural nets that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, language processing by recurrent neural nets that have evolved into more advanced forms. Uh, question answering machines. Uh, you may remember IBM's Watson that won Jeopardy. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, generative adversarial neural nets, which can be fun or uh, <laughs> can present a, a, a threat. Uh, reinforcement learning, of course, which is important. And finally, robotics. So let me put uh, deep learning, uh, which was missing from the previous slide on purpose, is that the deep learning is not itself a specific category, but rather a group of new tools that we're using, uh, though it's one of the most common phrases that the uh, press uses. What I want to show you is that uh, Artificial neural nets have been part of our toolkit since the, uh, the 2000s or even the 90s. Um, but what's happened is that we have uh, expanded on them and now created more uh, elaborate architectures for these neural nets. And we now refer to these as deep learning. So I know this is an eye chart, uh, what I want to show you is that there are many, many, many types of artificial neural nets, particularly in this new uh, second generation. Um, if you look up at the nodes on the left are the input nodes. And then as you move left to right, uh, the output is on the, uh, the right hand side. And what we call a, uh, a deep learning 
uh, or deep neural net is one that has uh, hidden layers in between the input layer and the output layer. And as you can see, almost all of these now have many hidden layers. So there are at least 27 different types of, of uh, neural nets. Uh, most of the action these days is in the uh, recurrent neural nets, which now include LSTMs and BERTs that we'll talk about in a minute toward the top, or the convolutional neural nets that you see diagrammed in the middle, or the uh, generative adversarial neural nets that you'll see down toward the bottom. Uh, just remember that uh, deep learning means adding hidden layers to a, a neural net. Um, now, some deep nets may have just say a half a dozen hidden layers, uh, but for example, uh, back when uh, Microsoft first reached uh, the ability to identify images with the same accuracy as a human, that CNN that they used at that time had 152 hidden layers. And the problem is, of course, that every time you add a hidden layer, uh, you increase computational complexity uh, and also weaken the signal. So adding more hidden layers uh, is a, uh, a kind of a, a devil's choice. Uh, you're better off with fewer, but many, many times it takes many, many more to do that. So now we're going to spend just a couple of minutes on uh, each of the different types of new uh, deep neural nets. And we'll start here with number one, which is image processing relies mostly on convolutional neural nets. Now, uh, remember that uh, our tools really can't do anything that hasn't been reduced to numbers. So the purpose of the front end of a convolutional neural net marked here as feature extraction uh, is to discover the features hidden in each uh, RGB pixel of an image, uh, convert it to a numerical value uh, and create uh, increasingly uh, sophisticated and deep uh, numerical vectors that will uh, then be put into a classifier that let us tell um, whether or not this is a dog or a cat or a boat or a bird. Now, typically what would happen is we would scan the image at left uh, starting with, say, a matrix of 32 by 32 pixels, could be bigger, uh, and then develop vectors for, for each of those 32 by 32 uh, grids. Uh, the, the second convolution might very well be 28 by 28. The third feature map might be 14 by 14, uh, and so on through the hidden layers uh, until you get down to a point where your, your classifier on the back end can reliably determine uh, whether or not the image is uh, what you say it is. Now, a uh, couple of things. Uh, because we are reducing all of these images to uh, numerical vectors, one of the interesting things you want to keep in mind is that I can also run them backwards by inputting a numerical vector on the right-hand end and actually generate an image on the left-hand end. Um, but once again, every time we add a layer, uh, we add complexity. So you might think of convolutional neural nets strictly as automatic feature extractors. Uh, the problem is um, that they are not necessarily interpretable by human beings. So you see here, um, these are three different layers of feature extraction from uh, that car. And of course, no human being could really make sense of those images uh, that have been produced. Um, also, uh, remember that it takes a lot of labeled training data to train a convolutional neural net. You could probably get acceptable performance with about uh, 5,000 labeled uh, images per, uh, per category, uh, but it would take 10 million labeled examples per category to match or exceed human performance. So uh, it's really kind of a brute force approach uh, and now you can see why the speed of compute and our ability to spread the compute over multiple uh, machines in massive parallel processing becomes so important. However, uh, just remember uh, that that time and that time on the machine, which you'll probably be renting from Amazon or Google or someone like that, uh, has a cost associated with it. So expensive 
and time consuming from several days to several weeks of runtime to train a particularly large convolutional neural net that can meet uh, human uh, levels of identification. And that much labeled data generally just isn't available. There are, however, two approaches these days to doing uh, CNNs. Of course, the first one is doing it from scratch, which we just talked about, where you'd need thousands to millions of uh, items of, of uh, label training data. Uh, you'd need huge amounts of compute. Uh, the problem would stretch over days, but the model accuracy can be uh, extremely high. Now, the, the problem with this approach, of course, is that it requires real experts uh, and time. Uh, and frankly, there's a, well, there's a scarcity of folks with these skills. Also, uh, it's not enough uh, just to show your, your convolutional neural net one image of your target item, uh, but rather you have to allow for all of the different ways that the CNN might actually end up seeing the, uh, the item. So it can be translated or rotated or uh, brighter or uh, dimmer or even larger or smaller. You know, is the cat the same color? No, the, the, there are different colors of cats and you have to represent all of those uh, if you want your CNN to train adequately. The second approach is one that uh, a lot of businesses have adopted today. Uh, and here we owe a debt of thanks to Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, uh, who have provided very, very large uh, foundational convolutional neural net models um, that are, which they'll allow you access to, uh, which you can use as the basis for what we now call transfer learning. Now, basically in transfer learning, you would take a, uh, one of the master uh, convolutional neural nets that's already been trained uh, by one of the uh, big organizations. Uh, you would simply cut off the classifier on the back end. Uh, you would add the specialized images. For example, if, if, uh, uh, if, if your data set includes, I don't know, specialized tools or specialized equipment or pictures of uh, a particular type of uh, plant, you would add those to the data, database. And then uh, now you can rerun and retrain the CNN, uh, which always already has uh, many of its uh, convolutions already trained up. And this is much faster. You can do this uh, with perhaps just a few hundred or a few thousand images um, and it's quite fast. So this is a, a way that a lot of folks are now doing uh, convolutional neural nets in business also remember, however, that uh, all of this powers facial recognition. And so uh, facial recognition has been getting a lot of bad press lately. <clears throat> and so here's the, uh, the good news or the bad news, depending on your point of view, uh, because convolutional neural nets can be, uh, can be uh, confused by just a little bit of noise. So uh, for example, uh, that hat on the left, you can buy that today. Uh, on the on the internet as a way of uh, uh, foiling um, facial recognition system cameras. Uh, and the stop sign on the right is even more interesting uh, because just a couple of these uh, pieces of tape on this stop sign uh, would cause an autonomous vehicle not to recognize this as a stop sign. As a matter of fact, this particular example, which was developed in 2017, on one of the largest uh, Microsoft CNNs actually makes the car think that the stop sign is a banana. So uh, for whatever reason, the features effective for banana uh, corresponded to those uh, pieces of tape combined with the stop sign. So uh, I guess the good news is, yes, you can hide from facial recognition. The bad news is uh, you have to watch out for noise uh, and particularly that in point of fact, uh, bad actors could actually weaponize this noise to uh, fool self-driving cars or other autonomous systems uh, with just a little bit of uh, tape. Okay, number two, uh, natural language processing. And uh, the, the naming convention for these deep neural nets, which started as recurrent neural nets have now 
evolves through LSTMs, which means long short-term memory. Uh, and finally today, you would probably use a variation uh, called a bidirectional encoder representation transformer or BERT for short, uh, but they are all developed from uh, the uh, recurrent neural nets. Now, these, these types of problems and this type of technique is best used uh, in sequence problems. So text and speech that falls in that category, since the next character or the next word uh, in any stream of text is likely to be logically related to the one preceding it. So uh, RNNs handle uh, the understanding of text questions as well as the formulation of complex responses. Uh, they're also good for forecasting uh, and time pattern recognition problems like prices or stock values or sales forecasts and also for gameplay. So where convolutional neural nets uh, relied on spatial relations, uh, recurrent neural nets process information as a time series uh, in which each subsequent piece of data relies in some way on the, the data item that came before. Now, every time we need to increase the total time needed to remember, that is the number of game plays, for example, we need to add a layer. Uh, and every time we add a hidden layer, uh, we increase the compu computational complexity, uh, the time to train, we weaken the signal, which makes it harder to train. Uh, and so uh, these uh, evolutionary um, upgrades to RNNs like LSTMs and now BERTs have all been designed to address some element of these uh, problems. However, uh, in 2016, so it's been five years, we hit 95% uh, accuracy uh, in a, a robot being able to uh, accurately interpret human text and speech. So that almost instantaneously uh, blew up this market that includes uh, chatbots. It gave us Siri and Alexa. Uh, it gave us uh, the ability to communicate by uh, voice with our phones and other devices and it gave us intelligent automation, which is also known as robotic, robotic process automation. And that's often the place where companies these days start their, uh, their digital pursuit in AI and ML. That's the new low hanging fruit. Now this third type is actually a lot of fun. Uh, and despite that it's got this huge name, generative adversarial neural nets, uh, these are designed to make training more efficient. Uh, they're still relatively young in their application, so there's a lot to be learned yet here. Uh, but remember that convolutional neural nets uh, can be fooled by just a little bit of noise so that they can be intentionally hacked. So consider this example. Let's suppose that you wanted to uh, guard the safe where you were hold holding all your valuables with a, uh, a retinal reader. Uh, but in point of fact, the retinal reader based on a convolutional neural net model could be hacked. Uh, so uh, GANs are a strategy for creating CNNs that are much less likely to be uh, fooled. So here's the basic concept. Uh, there are two convolutional neural nets that are put in competition with each other. Uh, the first one is known as the discriminator and its task is to correctly classify an image uh, that you're training it for. Uh, the second the, uh, generator, remember that CNNs can be run backwards from random seeds to create uh, images, and that's what the generator does. So the task is to, so the generator's task is to produce images that will fool the discriminator, and they battle it out until they reach an evolutionary draw in which the uh, two systems are are uh, optimized against each other. So uh, here, for example, uh, was an early example in which the discriminator was trained to recognize uh, this particular school of French painting. Uh, the generator was set the task of generating fake uh, French paintings from this period to fool the, uh, the discriminator. 
uh, and they went at it for millions and millions of generations until finally the generator uh, could produce images that were almost to the point where the discriminator couldn't tell the difference. So when uh, that ability to discriminate reached zero, uh, then the, uh, the two systems were trained and now the, uh, the, uh, the, the learning system, the discriminator CNN uh, could uh, almost assuredly not be fooled by a little bit of noise. Still, these are uh, uh, very difficult to train, but they are as close as we've come to having machines that learn by themselves without human intervention. Unfortunately, uh, these GANs are also the ones that enable, enable today's deep fakes that I'm sure you've all read about. Uh, it's a problem uh, that it creates for us in a culture where the truth of photographic evidence is being called into question. Um, but it also allows for uh, extremely sensitive video analysis to define patterns that were frequently or, or formerly undetectable. And number four in our new toolbox is uh, reinforcement learning systems. Um, and of our new uh, artificial intelligence disciplines, up to this point, they've all been based on deep neural nets. But that's not necessarily true of the uh, next three, including uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is, is uh, by de facto the third leg, third leg in machine learning alongside supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, and it is a method of training a system to recognize the best outcome in direct response to its environment. Now there's not a single algorithm here, but a group of custom applications. Uh, and uh, yes, some of them can be powered by uh, deep neural nets, uh, but other, others of them don't need deep neural nets. Uh, this is the core technology in self-driving cars. Uh, it's the core technology that allowed uh, computers to win at AlphaGo um, and uh, to beat us now at a whole variety of other games. So here uh, in this uh, diagram, basically what goes on is that there are uh, two things that you can do, prediction, um, to dramatically simplify this. Um, that is, for example, how much reward can I expect uh, from every combination of future states. Uh, that is, uh, how much can we collect, hope to collect from delinquent accounts based on the following set of steps. Or control, which is autonomous vehicles, or gameplay, that is by moving through all the possible combinations of an environment and acting with the environment, find a combination of actions that, that maximize the reward. Uh, that is, win the game or <laughs> don't crash. So reinforcement learning actually uh, comes from uh, the, uh, the natural world. Uh, and our little uh, newborn antelope here is the poster child uh, because like that antelope that learns to stand up and actually run within about four or five minutes of the time it's born, uh, that's an evolutionary requirement for survival. And it's pretty much the same thing for recurrent neural nets. So the, the key to uh, understanding when to use a uh, reinforcement learning system is uh, the data for learning doesn't currently exist. Remember we talked about the uh, labeled data problem uh, or you don't wanna wait to accumulate it because uh, the delay might be too costly uh, or because the data may change rapidly uh, causing the outcome to change more rapidly than a typical refresh cycle can handle. Uh, that might be particularly true in a car looking at a, uh, a new roadway that it's never seen before if it's operating in an autonomous mode. So uh, there are uh, lots of details here. I'm going to skip over most of this slide uh, other than to say that uh, reinforcement learning is still very early in its, uh, in its application. Uh, there are a great many challenges in each uh, effort to train one. Uh, these are the general names and descriptions of some of those. Uh, and we fail to train on our error RLS systems about 70% of the time. However, uh, when they do, 
they are an interesting and excellent solution to this particular type of problem. Now, the, the fifth type of knowledge or, or technique rather that we talked about in artificial intelligence is uh, question answering machines. Uh, and you may have noticed that so far we've been talking about decision making systems that have no knowledge of content beyond what they've been shown in the training data. Uh, but our AI college student or robot employee or robot barista still needs to have some knowledge to apply to their uh, environment. So if you remember this story, uh, the Watson that lives in our imagination in 2011 uh, actually won against human contestants uh, in this popular game show called Jeopardy. Of course, it actually took IBM uh, almost seven years with a team of about 20 data scientists to develop it. So it was no slam dunk. Uh, and by the way, Jeopardy did, um, Watson did not win in a walk-off. Uh, it made plenty of its own mistakes. Uh, so uh, why haven't we heard more about Watson in the popular press today or question answering machines? Well, uh, the, what, what actually lives in the imagination of people in the popular press about this particular technique is actually old technology uh, for us. And it's a good illustration that not all of the promising new approaches in data science can be a home run. This is a, uh, a bit of an eye chart uh, that describes the working of Watson. But here's the, uh, the general story. You know, the, the dream of Watson was be, to be able to deposit all the knowledge for a particular domain in a database, think uh, taxes or chemistry or medicine, um, and have not just a search engine, uh, but an engine that would find obscure linkages and combine them in a way uh, that it could deliver not only a menu of possible answers like Google, uh, but the one best answer, and perhaps one that we haven't thought of before. So the distinction with search, search like Google delivers you a menu of possible outcomes that you can a select from. A question answering machine is, to des is designed to deliver the one best answer that best meets the, uh, the problem that you've posed. So the, uh, the requirement here is that humans load and continuously curate uh, its knowledge base, which is called the corpus. Uh, and they also load a variety of test questions uh, designed to show that, uh, designed to illustrate for the QAM uh, the relationship between inquiries and topics. Uh, and then uh, the QAM should be able to go beyond those uh, examples by creating its own tests and delivering uh, its own results. So why did I say this might be a dead end? Well, not, not really a dead end, but uh, for example, uh, by 2015, IBM had already invested north of $15 billion uh, in Watson. Uh, and you used to hear an awful lot about Watson being used uh, in hospitals for uh, really advanced patient treatment, but that's been pretty much uh, brought to a halt. Uh, IBM was working with uh, Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center, and also with MD Anderson on projects like this. Uh, and both of those projects have been pretty much abandoned. And, and the reason is uh, that it required doctors uh, to continuously load important information into it, but more importantly, uh, to remove information that was no longer accurate. And that just took a lot of time. So Watson and the concept of question answering machines will work in domains that are that are relatively constrained, think taxes, tax law. Uh, but in these open-ended applications, it's proving to be very expensive and time consuming to try and keep up with the body of knowledge. And finally, we've got robotics. So uh, these days, uh, yes, you, you could make uh, robots learn by using reinforcement learning. Uh, but that's not actually the way most robots are programmed today. Mostly it's just really uh, clever engineering based on physics. Uh, but still, uh, we need to be able to uh, make our 
artificial intelligence systems sufficiently mobile that they can interact with us uh, in our own environment. Now, the problem, of course, is uh, how smart it is versus how useful it is. Uh, we, we have gone a ways toward combining artificial intelligence into robotics, and that's an opportunity for you that are just starting out in this field. Uh, but as this uh, image is meant to uh, point out that robots don't always have enough AI in them. In this case, of course, uh, the, uh, the self floor pleading robot couldn't recognize the, uh, the dog poop and smeared it everywhere. So, oh, if it only had a brain, huh? <laughs> okay, so, so those were our six new data science techniques that data scientists uh, would consider the building blocks of artificial intelligence in data science. Um, but now let's talk about a little bit about how you're actually going to learn and practice this. Now, first of all, let me tell you that uh, despite the uh, excitement that we may have created around new techniques, that probably 75, 80, 85 percent of the applications of data science in business today are not these techniques. They are good old machine learning. Uh, tell me what the customer is going to buy next. Tell me when the machine is going to break down. Uh, almost all of it classification, though it is based on now on increasingly on big data categories of uh, unstructured and semi-structured data. The other thing I want to impress upon you is that data science is not like learning a programming language. You know, a little history here. Um, if you go back to say 2000, uh, and you were to uh, come into the field as I did, what you would find is a field dominated by two companies, SAS and SPSS, now part of IBM. Uh, and in those days, you wrote models in SAS and SPSS proprietary code. Now, very rapidly, uh, by 2005, 2007, uh, both of those companies had moved away from code uh, and toward uh, drag and drop automated uh, coding platforms so that the, the requirement to code was greatly reduced, but you still got um, access to all the, the model hyperparameters. Now we haven't talked about hyperparameters, but let me point out that every one of our techniques has a whole variety of uh, tuning metrics that we call hyperparameters that need to be adjusted by a data scientist uh, in order to, to operate as accurately as possible. So, um, one of my personal concerns about coding uh, is that it tends to distract you from the requirement to tune the hyperparameters. I got you up into uh, the middle 2000s uh, with the first incoming uh, of uh, drag and drop platforms. Uh, then we hit in 2007 or 2008, uh, we introduced R. Uh, and the teaching universities largely abandoned the tools provided by SAS and SPSS in favor of teaching uh, data science by code using R. Uh, R was replaced by Python. And today, if you're learning uh, data science, you're almost surely going to be taught Python. But this graph on the right, which you'll recognize as one of Gartner's uh, standard magic quadrants, shows the, uh, the leaders uh, in these analytic platforms today. And what I've done here uh, is all of those circled in orange or red are platforms that are very rapidly moving back toward uh, semi-automated or fully automated uh, data science applications. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, they are uh, no code like data robot or low code like SAS or uh, Alteryx. Um, and because there are now so many models to be maintained, uh, this level of automation allows you to uh, a single data scientist to do the, the work of a great many data scientists uh, in less time. The, uh, the other thing um, that you need to be aware of is, is that, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, the data scientist was expected to be able to do it all, uh, to use all the techniques to select and assemble all the required databases, uh, to uh, train and create the models, to move those models from test into production. 
but the world today is just too complex for any one data scientist to master all of this. So even the technique side, um, ap uh, the application of your skills, uh, you'll see that data science skills are splintering into these four groups. There's uh, the traditional customer behavior uh, and risk modeling. That's probably, again, 75 or 80% of the opportunity today. Uh, there's physical system modeling, anomaly detection, preventive maintenance. That's an increasingly important area. Uh, speech, text, and chatbot, that's, that's a, a separate uh, specialty today, as are uh, image-based recognition and autonomous uh, vehicle platform systems, a separate area. So uh, during your education as a data scientist, if you choose that, uh, toward the end of that, you'll want to think about which of these you'll want to specialize in, or uh, alternatively wait until you get to your first job uh, and then uh, train up after that. Uh, the second split here is uh, between data science and data engineers. Uh, and increasingly companies are, are establishing data engineers as a separate category of worker uh, who handles all the setup of the database, the accumulation and cleaning of the data, um, and then the, uh, the movement of the models uh, into production so that the data scientist can handle just the, uh, the data science portion. All of these, uh, by the way, uh, the, the salary rates for these uh, are surprisingly pretty much the same. Um, and while you're probably aware uh, that the demand for data scientists and, and data engineers has doubled over the last 24 months, uh, you should also be aware that the supply, you all, uh, has also doubled over the last 24 months. So uh, while the pay remains very attractive, uh, it's the, uh, the skills that you have or will get are no longer in shortage, and that'll make it a little more challenging. So what we haven't talked about, uh, now that we're down to the fun stuff here, uh, is artificial general intelligence, and whether or not you think of that as uh, the, uh, the Terminator or as uh, Rosie the robot, um, we, we know from our little modeling exercise earlier that a real AGI system will have to display human-like general intelligence, not just tied to a specific set of tasks. Uh, and it also has to be able to generalize what it's learned and especially to, to extend those generalizations into contexts that are qualitatively quite different from what it's seen before. Uh, so uh, how close are we to achieving artificial general intelligence? Well, there's really no agreement. Uh, there was a panel of seven very highly regarded experts uh, recently um, asked the same question and their guesses ranged from seven to 70 years before we achieve AGI. Uh, the median was out around 2040, uh, but it sounds like this is gonna be a lot harder than we think. Um, there is uh, an interesting thing going on about where we move from here. Now, now if you're a data scientist in business, uh, you'll want to keep up with what's going on in these areas. Uh, but frankly, unless you pursue a PhD, you probably won't be researching or advancing these areas. Uh, but there are four major uh, pathways along which data science is advancing today uh, that are really just start that don't that only are just beginning to have demonstration ability. Um, and so in the middle, uh, high performance computing, you read about this all the time. Uh, this is the ability to train larger and larger models more efficiently. So the faster that we can push our, uh, our, deep, our deep neural nets uh, through the compute stage or spread them out over uh, more and more boxes, uh, the less expensive they'll be and the more of them that we can do. Uh, quantum computing, I think, probably speaks for itself. We all know a little bit about quantum computing. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, you can actually uh, go out on uh, IBM's or Microsoft's quantum computer today and, and train on it. Uh, you'll need to ask for permission, uh, but it's generally granted. Uh, and you can use their new uh, quantum computing programming language uh, to experiment with that. Uh, only if you're very motivated. Obviously, that's a very complex area. 
Um, at the top, uh, tiny ML is a, a, a very rapidly expanding area uh, relating to uh, our ability to shrink down the circuitry, uh, the hardware circuitry that learns, that can be trained so that it's small enough uh, and can be run with a small enough battery uh, to be put in a very tiny object, like a phone uh, or like a key fob on, uh, uh, say you wanted to monitor your pet, like your dog, uh, or on any sort of IoT application. So uh, these are the uh, extremely specialized, very small, uh, very low power chips that are becoming available and as we speak, mostly for IoT applications. Now, the one that I skipped over here is the one that I'm betting on perfect, uh, personally, and that's neuromorphic spiking neural nets. And I know that's a mouthful. Uh, so let me talk about that for just a second. Um, our neural nets, our deep neural nets, uh, are based on this fiction that they are supposed to look like the way the brain is organized. And that's uh, because what you'll see is that all the neurons are detect are attached to all the other neurons, and that when uh, any neuron fires, all the neurons fire, and that's just not the way the brain works. Also, if you look at the uh, uh, the energy signature from a uh, spike of an actual brain neuron, what you'll see is that there's a large initial spike and then that there are several smaller spike. So we really don't know yet whether or not uh, there is additional information contained in those smaller spikes or whether or not it's contained in the height of those spikes or maybe it's even contained in the, uh, the distance between the spikes. So spiking neuromorphic neural nets are basically advanced chips that are designed uh, to utilize this spiking technology um, and uh, to therefore break through into another area of um, data science. Now, there are actually companies that have these in production today. If you look at uh, brain chip holdings, it's actually listed on a stock exchange. You could invest in it today if you wanted to. Um, but uh, their chips um, show some really, really interesting behaviors. For example, uh, when one of their chips was exposed to just a series of uh, a, a moving image of a freeway in which cars were passing, after just a few minutes of observing the cars passion, passing on the image and without any external programming or, uh, uh, or impetus, it started counting the cars. Um, these are also being used now in some uh, uh, some casinos in Las Vegas uh, where they've been programmed into the uh, to the uh, image watching uh, the cameras over the table where the neural net can actually learn the game uh, and actually spot cheaters more efficiently than human beings can. Uh, so if I had to guess about a uh, uh, about a technology that was going to take data science into the next generation. Uh, of course, you can't ignore any of the four that we've talked about, but I'm particularly excited about these neuromorphic neural nets. So let's bring this uh, conversation to a close. Um, I think we all understand that artificial intelligence and machine learning is in fact uh, the next great lever for corporate growth. Uh, there have been many. Uh, and now we are posed, poised on this uh, brink of implementation. So let's talk about how this happens uh, because uh, managers in business uh, are used to managing people, processes and technologies as separate entities. And that's something that business executives are comfortable with. And over the uh, recent past, say up through the 90s, the three most major innovations for improving business were, you may recall, process improvement, re-engineering, and then even business intelligence. So those are all concepts that can be reasonably well understood by reading a good book 
uh, and their adoption by corporations reflects that. That is, a business manager would go home, he'd read a book, and the next thing you know, you were in one of these projects. But now data science is by definition more complex uh, and requires more knowledge of data scientists. Uh, and it also requires knowledgeable business managers to identify uh, targets uh, to form the specialized teams that are required to actually implement AI and L solutions. So through about 2017, um, the, uh, the underlying algorithms of the data and the compute were changing so rapidly it was difficult to help. But for roughly the last three years, uh, we have specifically exited the era of rapid innovation and we're now entering the era of full-time implementation. Now, it's not about getting some data scientists to sprinkle some AI ML on your organization. Uh, it, it starts with your analysis of processes that could be improved, your understanding of the many ways in which AI ML2 tools could be integrated uh, into your processes uh, for improvement. Uh, one of them that we've spoken about a couple of times just because it's so popular these days is robotic process automation. This is the new low hanging fruit for uh, implementing AI and ML as a good starting point uh, for many companies. Not necessarily the only point, but certainly one that's become extremely popular today. So I hope this has helped you better frame the environment that lies ahead for you if you choose to pursue data science uh, or to become more successful business managers who have now some knowledge and skills to recommend and implement data projects. Uh, with that, uh, we'll be happy to entertain a few questions. Thank you so much, sir, for the very insightful lecture. I hope all of you enjoyed the session. I surely did. We have a lot of questions raised by many of the members in an audience. Thank you all for being so attentive, but we are really sorry that due to the time limitations we have, we would be able to address a few for now, and then we'll try to answer the remaining questions individually after. So we have our first question. Someone in the audience wants to know, what is the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning? <laughs> Uh-oh, I hope they asked that question early in the presentation and not late, otherwise I really messed up. <laughs> yes, sir, it was asked uh, during the starting of the presentation. Okay. Okay, so another question is, uh, what are the job opportunities available in artificial intelligence and machine learning? Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about this in the presentation, uh, and I would make a couple of points. Uh, first of all, uh, the field is rapidly splitting between data scientists and data engineers. Um, and don't be afraid of taking the data engineer path uh, even though you'll be basically uh, dealing with the infrastructure and the implementation of the models that are produced, the, the salary levels are uh, roughly the same as data scientists today. Uh, there are not enough data engineers to go around. Um, and uh, it's, it can be a very satisfying career. In terms of the techniques, uh, almost all the business classifications, uh, uh, business applications uh, remain in uh, classification of some sort of consumer behavior. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is, you know, we talked a little bit about accuracy. Uh, it's, it's interesting, remember that, that accuracy in a model, if you have 50% uh, accuracy, that's, there's a coin flip, so that's not much good. Uh, generally speaking, when we're dealing with uh, consumer modeling, if we get to about 70%, we're, we're happy. We can get higher than that, but 70% is a useful model. Uh, but if you're modeling things that are physical phenomena, like uh, a, a manufacturing process or a machine, uh, you ought to be able to get to 90, 95, 99%, because what you're really doing is just describing the rules of physics. Uh, and so I think it's telling uh, that whenever you get human beings involved, uh, our, our predictive capability just isn't as good. Okay. So most of our attendees are college-going students and recent college graduates. So I'm sure all of them were interested in knowing the job opportunities in the field. Thank you for answering that. The third question is... I didn't follow the question. Yes, sir. The question is, a lot of people seem to fight against or be fearful of artificial intelligence. Why do you think that is? Ah. 
There's a lot of conversation about ethics in artificial intelligence these days. Um, and it, it deserves a place. Uh, most of the conversation is around uh, convolutional neural net solutions and uh, recurrent neural net solutions. Uh, and the reason is uh, that as we showed in picture form, uh, you can't really tell what the machine learning application is focusing on to make a decision. Uh, should, is this, uh, you know, is this person a uh, friend or foe? Uh, you're well familiar with the uh, situations in which it's misclassified uh, people by race or by sex. Uh, people are also worried about whether or not uh, there is a hidden bias in uh, making important, for example, financial decisions like do I get the loan or do I not get the loan? And those are legitimate concerns. Um, Almost universally, as a data scientist, I would tell you uh, that that those could be solved by training with more data uh, until you get a uh, trained model that no longer shows those defects, because you could test for those defects. Um, I understand that people who have only read the popular press, uh, and the popular press is, is just as much to blame here as anything. Um, have read a lot of bad stuff about artificial intelligence. But once you're on the inside looking out, I think you can see that almost all of these problems have technical solutions uh, that you as data scientists can address. Okay. Uh, so one other attendee has asked, what are the major impacts of chatbots in the upcoming days or years? Impact oh. of chatbots. Yes, sir. Oh, just chatbots? Well, uh, okay. So basically we're talking about uh, voice recognition systems. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, of course, first of all, uh, many of us are now used to in text or, or voice uh, communicating with customer service reps or posing questions to websites uh, in the form of natural language. Uh, which is, makes it very easy. It also makes it possible for the receiving company uh, to reduce labor cost and to handle those uh, inquiries much more efficiently, especially, for example, during hours uh, when it's just not possible to have a human being uh, in sufficient quantity to answer those calls. Um, the, uh, I think the uh, more interesting aspects of chatbots are actually in... Uh, for example, the instantaneous translation of one language to another, which is going to make a, a big difference in our ability to break down barriers between our, our different cultures and countries. Uh, and then finally, uh, though it's not technically a chatbot application, um, our ability just to speak to uh, our devices in natural language uh, makes our whole uh, method of interacting with them uh, so much easier. So those, those are the big ones. Okay. Uh, so one of our research fellow with the Emerging Tech Foundation has a question. She wants to know what are the ways by which the problem of shortage of specific real world data for unconventional models can be solved? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, give me the question one more time, please. Yes, sir. What are the ways by which the problem of shortage of specific real world data for uh, unconventional models can be solved. How can we solve the problem of shortage of data for the models? Oh, I'm sorry, okay, <laughs> Shivani, I beg your pardon. Shortage of data. Uh, that's a problem. Um, in point of fact, there are actually types of, uh, there, there's a whole industry within, sub-industry within data science uh, that has sprung up uh, to create low cost labeled data uh, so that we could get past that problem. In image recognition, uh, it, it's particularly difficult uh, because right now, pretty much all the images have to be labeled. So you'll have to find uh, a low cost labor source. Many of these are, are hosted in uh, low labor cost countries where actual human beings go through and label images on your behalf at a cost. 
Uh, natural language processing tends not to have that problem just because there is so much text available. But now when you are, are talking about the more traditional uh, customer propensity modeling, uh, there, there, there simply is a minimum amount of data required um, for, for simple uh, consumer uh, modeling. Uh, I used to tell my clients, uh, if, if you give me 500 data points, I can give you a general idea. If you give me 5,000 data points, I can give you a pretty good idea. And at 50,000 to 500,000 data points, I'm really comfortable that I can give you a pretty precise answer. So uh, one of the areas where this becomes a problem, and you saw this in reinforcement learning slides, is if the phenomenon that you have is new and no data has yet been created, uh, you're gonna have to frankly wait until uh, some data is available or alternatively use an RLS technique. Um, it's also possible to find value in uh, low, low accuracy models, uh, but that depends on the particular application that you're uh, working on. I guess the real answer is uh, there is there is no direct solution uh, to having just a little bit of data. Uh, you have to have enough data to give you a, a reliable and repeatable solution. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's take one last question for the day. Sir, could you please brief us on the future of artificial intelligence? Okay, well, I was hoping you were paying attention when I talked about the, uh, uh, the four major uh, thrusts into the future. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the strong compute, uh, the hypercompute, the, uh, uh, the neuromorphic neural nets, uh, the tiny ML, uh, and of course, quantum. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on neuromorphic neural nets. Uh, quantum uh, will have its own interesting set of uh, problems to deal with, uh, but you should also be aware that quantum is able uh, to train traditional deep neural nets. So when we do finally get quantum, uh, the, the whole issue of uh, taking a long time to train a convolutional neural net will completely go away. Uh, essentially, they'll be uh, instantaneously trained. Um, and tiny ML, um, I think has a, a big future in consumer applications and in industrial IoT applications. Uh, and I would look to those uh, two areas in addition to neuromorphic neural nets uh, as the uh, direction of the future. Okay, thank you, sir. I hope Mr. Warritz was able to answer all of your doubts. I know we still have a lot of questions, but due to the time constraints, we won't be taking any further questions. Now, moving forward, I want to invite Mr. Prasad Mahbudri, CEO, University of Emerging Technologies, to present his thoughts on the opportunities in emerging tech. So please. Thank you, Shivani. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. It's been a wonderful uh, insight into AML. You know, uh, uh, Bill and I share a lot of uh, uh, friendship for a long, long time, you know, actually. And, and uh, you know, he's been always amazing to me. And uh, I, I can share a small anecdote, you know, what are the odds that you walk into a bar in the uh, Netherlands and you talk about, uh, about data science and uh, the other guy knows Bill, <laughs> okay? And I talked to somebody, you know, oh, I know Bill Warriors, you know, because he has been so popular on uh, Data Science Central. And I would say that, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of data scientists, uh, upcoming data scientists have known Bill for a long time because he, he has been a big champion of uh, data science. In fact, for a lot, lot of people um, who don't know Bill, that Bill has started a predictive modeling company in 2001, 2002, when nobody even realized what is predictive modeling is. So you know, he has been a champion for a long, long time, you know, even before the, the so-called parallel computing and the big data came up, he was doing that. And I've been uh, associated with him. I'm very thankful for that. Thank you very much, and also I, you know, I would, I would, I would say thank you, Venkat, for really uh, supporting this, and uh, you know, I thank everybody. But again, um, I think my main uh, focus right now is to um, 
actually uh, uh, give you some insights into what is this uh, University of Imaging Technology is and what are the opportunities and how can you get uh, something out of it. First of all, uh, as, as uh, uh, you know, Shivani said in, you know, in the beginning, we are all about evangelizing, educating, empowering, enlightening, and of course, engaging people into emerging tech because emerging tech is a, a, a must for us, you know, down the line and everything is changing and people have to move into that. And the traditional uh, universities and colleges cannot cope up with the pace and, and, and the, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the volume of uh, teaching, you know, teaching abilities and you know, the volume, they, ca they cannot handle the whole volume at all we feel. So that's why we thought there could be a university that can actually complement you know, uh, in what they're doing right now. So uh, what we focus on is basically uh, role-based education and experiential learning. I'll come to that in a minute. And then also, uh, uh, you know, there are other problems that we're trying to solve like, you know, camaraderie, you know, like real time shared boards and also uh, labs, etc. Uh, but anyway, right now, what we offer to people is a short certificate courses. Also, I want to say these are not for credit. And in the short certificate courses could be internships, practical trainings, and bundled, uh, you know, into micro degrees, you know, and then role based, role based and deployable. That means any course that you take that should be uh, 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 applied into, into the uh, real industry, and that means it should be really applicable, uh, deployable uh, skill that the people have, people could learn, right? So uh, absolutely, we want to be more applied technology than just technology. That's that's what the deal is, and also what we feel is there's a lot of upskilling and executive education and engineering and and combination of engineering and management is 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 uh, is possible. And that's what we, we are also promoting right now. So you know, we will come up, we'll give you the details if you can contact us down the line and also the websites uh, do, do a great job in explaining them. But definitely these are the two things that we are right now uh, uh, promoting and, and delivering as well. And we, there are other things that we are also doing for some of the colleges that we are picking up their uh, courses and we are, we, we are teaching them uh, uh, at their curriculum and under their supervision, but you know, giving all the labs, people, uh, a, a teachers, etc. Uh, we and we the the best thing that we have and we want to do is that you know providing academic enablers, you know, teaching assistants to almost twenty four seven, so that people can learn uh, these things very uh, easily and and be successful. Yeah, and, you know, and also what I say is, uh, you know, anything that is taught at Imaging Tech has to be of experiential learning. What is experiential learning? Experiential learning is project by top down and project by bottom up. That means you have to learn the application, not just the theory. Uh, and, and that's how we want to teach so that you learn better and you can apply better. So, so there are two things to this. One is the teaching itself, and the second one is the lab. So we have 24-7 lab, our own labs, and also we control, uh, we have our own uh, computer on the cloud. That means the labs. Basically, you don't have to worry about your anten uh, or, or not an antivirus, not installing something, uh, in, you know, some kind of a, a problem here and there. No, that DL is missing, this uh, Java version is missing. All that we want to take, take out of uh, the uh, students' problems and then uh, give them a lab so that they can actually learn the real thing rather than worrying about all other problems. So basically we are giving 20 live labs, live support. There will be academic enablers. And then we have a computer on the cloud and, and we also have, I'll show you some screen prints. We also have a real time shareable whiteboard, especially when, when you're learning online, it's always a, a, a problem that uh, people, uh, people have uh, no interaction with other people and then the 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 uh, you know the sessions and the, the, these sometimes you, you you want to collaborate and learn more you know because uh, you you don't see anybody physically it's all the more important to have a a shared board uh, where you can talk to other people 
and, and also share your ideas, brainstorm and all that. So that is also being given. So I think we have a lot of uh, uh, all these features actually will really help uh, the role-based education. So if you see what the unique features of uh, University of Emerging Technologies, we have role-based education, experiential learning, and you will have projects so you learn by doing. And, and, and you will get practitioner level skills if you, if you finish the micro degrees. And we have live classes. And in fact, that's one of the things that we are focusing on. It's not a, an impersonal uh, teaching. It's a, very much a personal teaching and live classes and 24-7 uh, live labs. And uh, of course, as I said, computer on the cloud and uh, personalized machines, you know, labs and all that. And there will be real humans, real life projects. And mostly uh, uh, we are uh, governed by the, the foundation or the Emerging Tech, the Emerging Tech Foundation. So there is a lot of industry orientation because our uh, advisory board monitors us. And as we say, it, this is a, a, a job focused economy creating uh, um, organization. We are socially responsible commerce. So we have job focused content. And also we are introducing some people skills where people should know how to behave in groups, in, in projects, and also be confident and talking to people, et cetera. So we'll also, we are also uh, introducing career prep support. You know, how do, how do, how do I uh, uh, prepare for my career? Where do I go? What do I learn next? And all that stuff. People have a lot of uh, uh, confusion right now but that we want to uh, address okay and also as i said you know we can bundle them into micro degrees so that you you get real practitioner skills and the biggest thing that we want to do is that we want to actually have an internship where we we can give people uh, education and also a project and a project with a, with a real life uh, example and you know real company that can come up in addition with the University of Emerging Tech and the foundation. And, and I'm very, very glad and thanks uh, uh, Venkat, they're representing CSI here. And we are actually going to announce uh, you know, the internships in, in, in association with the Computer Society of India and uh, you know, Global Engineering Dean's Council, um, and of course, along with the Emerging Tech Foundation. So there are lots of opportunities there, the cybersecurity, machine learning with Python and, you know, and, and you know, uh, mobile app development, you know, cloud computing, and you know, even digital marketing for that reason. So we we are into creating more jobs, more job oriented courses. And so, for example, we have a full stack Java development, and we have uh, an SAP uh, uh, ABA program, and we have uh, also oil and natural gas uh, focused, you know, data analytics and oil oil and natural gas and industrial automation, IIoT, the industry 4.0. And, uh, and uh, what uh, Bill was saying just now, the RPA, robotic process automation with the chatbots and all that stuff. And, um, and, and then, then also the, you know, introduction to hyperledger in, 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 uh, in uh, protecting the counterfeiting, et cetera, cybersecurity, uh, all that stuff, you know, all, all the jazz that you need uh, we are offering and please reach out to us uh, and we can also customize courses for uh, some schools and colleges, uh, whatever you need. And, and the idea is to give uh, an effective education and a practicable one and, and role-based learning and experiential learning. That's, that's the whole idea. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a, a, a virtual real-time um, uh, share board that, you know, we, you know you, infinite canvas, infinite boards, real-time and you can, you can draw anything, you can paste, you can cut and paste. You can also annotate the audio uh, at, the, at, at random times and all that stuff. So it is, it is going live. We have uh, uh, collaborated with this company uh, and this is a, this is a huge, huge uh, uh, help for the students to learn and, uh, effectively. So also what we do is we have certification from the, a nonprofit called the Emerging Tech Foundation. We can also uh, certify people in Emerging Tech and all other uh, uh, technology related fields. So definitely uh, we wanted to, um, we wanted to uh, help people get a certification and, uh, and, and, uh, and that, you know, it's, it's all about in econ you know, economic, economic value creation. That's what the deal is. Again, because uh, the shortage of uh, time, I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time if yours, but I really thank everybody to for, for attending this uh, conference. And it's a huge uh, uh, help. If you can reach out to us and, and ask more questions, we'd be there.
but uh, thank you again here is my contact for anybody to contact me thank you sir now on behalf of university of emerging technologies and our key sponsors i would like to thank all our speakers and attendees for making this summit happen without your support this wouldn't have been possible tomorrow morning at 10 am indian standard time we have mr shai zandani presenting his views on challenges in cyber security please visit our website for more information that's it from my side today hoping to see you all tomorrow thank you have a great day ahead thank you thank you all appreciate it